true. Uh, okay, just just let me interrupt you for a short while. So, if Jake, do you mind if people interrupt you to ask questions while you're talking? Um, it might be better in the interest of time just to put them into the chat, okay, uh, and and we can do them at the end. Okay, makes sense. Okay, in that case, yeah, sure. If anyone has questions, feel free to just uh, type it out in the chat, and we can we can go through the questions once we have some time. Jake, over to you. Okay, cool. Right, let's just get the sharing started. Okay, uh, can you see that? Mm -hmm. All right, and can you see that? Yep. Cool. Right. Okay, so um, <clears throat> my name is Jake Pizarro. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about test driven development. Uh, a little bit about me. Originally, I'm from New Zealand. I moved to Singapore 11 years ago. I've been a software developer for, for 20 years, the last two of which I've been at Indeed. And um, at Indeed, I work on a job recommendation product. Um, right. That's me in the panda, panda mask. It's my favorite picture I like to show to people when I do presentations. So now let's get started with the important bit. Why is engineering important? And the reason I ask this question is that TDD is, is undoubtedly an engineering discipline. So the reason it's important is that data science, machine learning and algorithms are not enough for you to succeed as an engineer. You need to deliver value and you need to deliver this value over long periods of time. This is called engineering. Why is this hard? It seems like it ought to be easy, but it's hard. So small projects are very agile. You write some code, you deploy it, you make money, you change your code, deploy it again, right? It's easy, cycles are quick, right? When small projects succeed, however, they tend to grow into large projects and these large projects are not nearly so agile. And unless you have to actually take steps to avoid this. So how do you know when this is happening? So one thing is, developers are afraid to change code, right? No one, no one wants to change code, no one refactors code because they're all afraid of breaking it. You see longer and longer test cycles. Instead of like being able to test everything in five minutes on your desktop, you, um, you then are, you, you're in the situation where it takes three, a team of five people three days to test it, right? You get more bugs, more failed releases, more production problems. Um, teams spend their time working around cone problems. Now, why is this? So it's kind of difficult to avoid this as projects grow. As you, one of the reasons is you make mistakes in the design of your code and the small applications make these mistakes less noticeable, right? But as you scale up, these mistakes become much, much more obvious and harder to fix. I mean, you could kind of think of it like you need to build a house for you, right? and you need to build it quickly. So you build a little house out of plywood and sheet metal. And it's great, it keeps the rain off you. You know, it's dry, warm. You, this house is great. More people want to come and live with you. You make your house bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, you build it, you keep building it out of plywood and sheet metal and you end up with a 12 story building and it collapses and everybody dies, right? So the design that was really, really good when you were small is not always the design that is really good when you are large. So how can you avoid this? Some of you are obviously thinking, don't make mistakes, but that's actually much harder than it sounds. Um, and we'll talk a bit about that later as well. Write clean code. This is important, right? Refactoring, this is also, this is actually really, really important. But in order to write clean code and to refactor, you need to have good tests. And this is the point of the talk. Test-driven development is the best way to create and maintain good tests. This is the, and this is this is based on reading on, on and all of my experience as a developer. So let's get started. This is the um, this is the presentation I gave my colleagues at Indeed, um, and one of my uh, friends who likes to give me a hard time put his hand up at the side and said, "Is it true, Jake? Did it really change your life?" And my answer to that was actually yes. When I learned about this, 
I, it fundamentally changed how I worked and how I approached everything and the, and it changed the effect that my work had. So yes, it did. It is a very, very powerful thing. This is the guy who created the original presentation. Um, he has an excellent book and video series called clean coders, which I can't recommend enough if you want to look at it right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to demo uh, some test driven development, but to new, in order to do that, we need to have a problem and we're going to take the problem that uncle Bob uses in his lecture. So the problem is how do we score a 10 pin bowling game, right? So 10 pin bowling, Pretty simple, two balls per frame, 10 frames. Let's walk through an example game and, and see how it works, right? So these are your 10 pins. So you roll your first ball, you knock down three pins, you put three in the big box. You roll your second ball, you knock down five pins, you put five in the little box. Great. Next frame, you, put, you roll your ball, you get five. You roll your ball, you get all the other pins down. You see this little slash in that in, the, in that little box. That means that it is a spare. Next frame, three, one. Right. Next frame, you hit on the next frame. You get all of the pins down, and you put a little X in that box. And this is called a strike. Right. We're just going to do some more as examples because we want to see what happens as we score them. Right. So two, seven, strike, 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 one uh spare and strike so how do we score this so basically you add up the two numbers in the box at a very basic level three plus five is eight right spares we get a bonus right so you've got the score is 10 right because you've got 10 pins down but you get to count the value of the next roll which is a three right so the score for this is 13 then for the next box we still count the three. So effectively your bonus is that you're double counting that three. For strikes, the score is 10 plus the value of the next two rolls, right? Again, so 10 plus two plus seven, 19, and we still count the two and the seven. Then we basically add up all the scores and that there we have it. So we're gonna do a little exercise. We're actually gonna create a program that does this, right? But let's think about how we design something like this, right? So, you know, we think about what objects do we have, right? So we've got a game, right? Has a role method where we put in the number of pins and their score where we can calculate the score at the end of the game. Great. We've got a frame, frames have scores, there's 10 of them. We have a role to track the number of pins, right? We've got, that could be one or two, right? The 10th frame is different. And we've got a relationship between the frames because we need to iterate through the frames. Okay, great. So fairly sort of basic design there. Right. <clears throat> Test-driven development has three main rules. The first rule is you cannot write production code until you have a failing unit test. Now I'll use the term production and test code uh, quite a lot in this presentation. Production code is the code that you write that runs on your production servers that your users interact with and that your company uses to make money. Test code runs in your build system or on your developer workstations, never goes into production, your users never see it, right? So that's the difference between production and test. The second rule, you must stop writing production code as soon as your unit tests pass, right? Next rule, you can only refactor when all of your tests are passing. So these rules are pretty simple, right? But what we end up with is kind of a little game that you have to play with yourself. And this is, this is the thing that I really wanna show you is what this game is. So the game is, what tests do I write in order to force me to write the code that I already knew I want to write, right? That's the game. So how do we do this? So we start, in the red phase, right? In this phase, we write failing test cases, right? Once we have a failing test case, we move to the green phase, right? Where we're writing production code. Once we've written enough production code to make our test pass, we go to the refactor. So let's do, let's start out with our example. So 
Uh, just a couple of notes. Uh, we're not going to bother with invalid input. Um, so like, you know, we're not going to check for this. In a real system, we'd do this, but in the interest of time, we're not going to cover this. Um, so there's two things we want to we want to see. When we write real code, it needs to be the simplest code possible. And you'll see what that means as I go through. The other one is the really important thing, and we're going to mention this again and again, is that we see your tests fail first and then pass, right? And we'll go into that again. So I want to write public class game, right? So the first thing I'm going, oh, the first thing I'm going to do is actually is I'm going to run my test to make sure that my test runs. Great. So we're going to write a test called can create game, right? And we're going to call it game G equals new game. Okay. So this is a failing test because it doesn't compile, right? So what can we do to make it compile? We can create the game class. So we're going to create it in there. Right. Okay. And we run our test and our test passes. Cool. So that was easy. Now, the next thing is I want to write a test where I, oh, sorry, I should have flipped between those colors actually. Just leave, we'll, we'll leave that. What's the simplest roll method that I can do? Right. So can roll zero is the simplest thing. Right. So we're going to cut and paste our test. G roll zero. Right. This is a failing test because it doesn't compile. So, oops, we're going to make the we're going to make the roll method. Right. We would put in the number of pins, and our test passes. Okay. So now we're going to do refactoring. So we don't really need can create game, right? Often it's quite common to write a test and delete it later. Think of it a bit like scaffolding in your house. You build the scaffolding, you build the part of the building, and then you don't need the scaffolding anymore. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, we're going to make that into a field and we're going to initialize it in a setup method, right? So that's our refactoring, our test passes. Yep. Good. So what's the next thing we want to write? Well, the obvious choice is the score method, right? But I can't write a score method until I've rolled a complete game. So what's the simplest game? that you can play and that you can roll for bowling, right? The simplest game is where you don't knock down a single pin, right? So it's 20 rolls, no pins down, the score of the game is zero, right? It's called a gutter game because your ball goes in the gutter every time. So we write a gutter game function. Right, we'll do 20 iterations, g dot roll, zero and we're going to going to go assert that g dot who we need a score method there we go oops g dot score is equal to, oops sorry there should be a equal to zero Okay, so this fails because it doesn't compile. We'll create the score method and we will return negative one. Num, we'll get, we'll discuss why that is in a minute. So our test fails, right? And our test fails because we're returning negative one. So we know that's not what we want. Right, so how can we make this test pass? What's the simplest, dumbest thing we can do? We can make it return zero. This seems really dumb and really unnecessary, but we've done something important. And that important thing is that we have made our test fail and then we've written some code and we've seen it pass. This is actually incredibly important. One of the reasons is that um, a lot of the, uh, people often write tests that don't actually test anything. 
So they write the code, they write the test, and then they um, they write the test in such a way that make a mistake. It doesn't test anything. You change the code, the test ought to fail, and it doesn't fail. That test is useless. So what can we do next? Uh, right. So we can write another test, a simple game, all ones. So the next, that's the next simplest game, all ones. So we're just going to copy and paste. Ones and the score for a game of all ones is 20. Right. So we have a failing test. Yes, our test fails. Now, how can we make it pass? If we put 20 in here, which is a very, very naive way of doing it, we just make our gutter game thing fail. So, right. So what we have here is two tests now that are both valid we can't get around it with doing something silly and, and very, very simple. So we actually have to be nominally smart. So what can we do here? We can make a very simple score method. We can score pins and add up the pins and we just return the score in here right now all of our tests pass right so that's basic now we've got passing tests let's do a bit of refactoring so one of the things that we always do with is we always refactor our tests right tests need to be refactored for the same reason that code needs to be refactored so let's do this we'll call that n the number of roles and we'll call that pins. I'll put that outside, make that a method call roll many. Yep, there we go. We'll inline those things because we don't need the separate variables. Okay, and we can also, I'll put that method at the end. We can also take out this assertion. Make an insert score method, keep that signature change, replace it, replace it. There we go. Our tests still pass and we have cleaner code. Okay, so what's the next simplest game that we can do after all ones? So we could do all twos, but the truth is that we know that this will already pass. We don't generally write tests that where we know they're going to pass. All threes is the same, all fours is the same, right? All fives, right? So this is an interesting case now. So all fives, we would have to start counting, accounting for uh, spares, right? So this is, this is an interesting case. So the next case we'll do is a single spare followed by gutter balls, right? So we'll go one spare. So in order to roll this, we go G roll five, G roll five again, it's a spare. Now, comments generally try to avoid because um, usually they mean you haven't named things properly. However, we're going to leave it for now and we'll deal with that when we come back to refactoring. So after that, we go G roll three, and then we go roll many. Um, we've got 17 zeros. And then we go, so it's score. The score for this should be what is it? 10 plus 3 is 13 plus 3 is 16. Right. So, search score 16. Why does that not? Oh, oops, that's wrong. We'll fix that later. Okay. So, this pest fails. Good. 
So how can we make it pass? Let's go back and look at our code. So let's see if we go in here and we go if score, oh no, 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 because something like if pins plus last pin, pin equals 10. I mean, you, that doesn't seem like a really good idea. This probably isn't going to work. And more importantly, something smells bad. This should be bothering us. It doesn't feel right. So what that feeling is, this is, the, this is a code smell, right? So something feels right. So we've probably done something wrong in our design. But I mean, how, how can that be possible? We've literally got two lines of code. So let's, let's, let's look at it, right? Let's get rid of that. Which function by its name indicates that it calculates the score? Well, that's the score function. Which function actually calculates the score, right? It's the role function. So this smell has a name. It's called misplaced responsibility. And it's very, very common. What you'll often see in commercial systems, is, in big systems, is that programmers know the system, right? So they know that really actually that this calculating score function actually happens in the roles, but you don't know this. So you've got to go looking for it. And as does every other new person who works on that system, right? So this is a common anti-pattern. So we're not going to do that. We're going to fix this, right? How can we fix this? Well, obviously we want the score to calculate the score. We're going to refactor, but in order to refactor, we have to have passing tests. And we have a failing test. Okay, so what do we do about that? We ignore it. Right? We ignore it because we want to go back a step, basically. So that's fine. Let's go back a step. Now, now, now our tests pass, and now we can do our refactoring. So what are we going to do? Let's keep a array private int roles, right? So we'll just keep a list of all of the roles equals new int. And we've how many, what's the maximum number of roles? It's 21. So we need a pointer into this private current, oops, private int current equals zero. Okay, so we've got our pointer. Uh, great. So now when we do a roll, we go rolls current plus plus equals pins. And then at the end, we add up the sum of the pins, right? So for i equals rolls okay and we go score plus equals rolls i right and that theoretically should pass yes okay great so that is a classic refactor, right? We have the tests are still passing, but the algorithm is now completely different. Okay, so now we can refactor. Let's get rid of that. Oops, nope, sorry, wrong one. Let's get rid of, let's make this one a local variable because we don't need a class variable for that. Our tests still pass. Yep, great, that looks good. Okay, so let's go back to where we were. Let's unignore this. Right, our test fails again. So we can go back and try and write the spares code again. So this time, right. So let's see if we can work out how to do spares. So if we go if rolls i plus rolls i plus one, 
equals 10. Okay. Oh, what's wrong with this? So what's wrong with this is that this would take the first the first roll and the second roll as a spare if they add to 10. It would also take the second roll and the third roll as a spare if they add to 10, which is not correct, right? So it needs to be within the boundaries of a frame. Oh, oh, but wait, 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 wait. We can do something like I and I percent two equals. No, we aren't gonna do this because that sucks. Um, right, so we need to refactor again. Right, because this is not a good way to do this. So let's go back. Let's ignore our test again. We've got passing tests, right? And we do a second refactoring here. So let's try a different approach. Let's iterate through the frames. Now there's only 10 frames. Frame, frame is less than 10, frame plus plus. Okay, great. Now we need an i, int i equals zero, right? And we can go, so we go through each frame and we add up the two balls that are in this frame, right? So we go score i rolls plus rolls i plus one, right? And our test passes. Right, so again, we have the same, same functionality, different algorithm. Right, now, this is probably a better place to go and start doing our spare work. Right, so our test fails. So how can we, how can we do the spare code for this? Right, so let's try this. If rolls i, plus rolls i plus one equals 10, right? I mean, that looks like a spare. Okay. And that's good. And then we should probably do an else here. Now, how do we calculate the score? Oh, we didn't increment i, that's bad, okay. So, okay. Right, so we know that for spares, the roll is 10 plus the next, first ball from the next frame. Right, oh, actually, you know what we just have to do? i plus equals, just see if this works. This is work or fail. No, this fails. Okay, and it fails because we weren't incrementing i properly. Right, so we increment i by two and then, great. That's our spare case handled. So, let's do a bit of refactoring and we will start with our test. So the first thing we're gonna do is get rid of that comment. Okay, right, we don't need that anymore. Now, the next thing we can do is, we've got a comment here, which means that probably we can name something better. So we'll just call this F is Spare. Great. Don't need that anymore. Okay. That looks pretty good. Now, what other things? I. I isn't a very good variable name. Let's look at that. Index of first ball in frame. I mean, this is technically correct, but it's a bit long. Let's try something else. First ball no not really great how about first in frame okay that's pretty good it is the first ball in the frame great so if it is spare then take 10 score is 10 plus the first ball that plus the 
two subsequent second subsequent ball. Okay, our tests still pass. Great. Right. So, what's the next most interesting test case? Is one strike. So let's go g dot roll ten. That is a strike. And we need two more rolls to see the benefit of the strike. So three and g dot roll four. Assert score, g dot score. And the score for that is 10 plus three plus four, which is 17 plus three plus four which is 24. Right, so that test fails. Great. Now, how can we make it pass? Let's go through and look at something similar. Right, so if rolls i equals 10. Oops, that should be first in frame. That looks like a strike. If it is, how do we how do we calculate the score? Right, so the score is ten plus the next next ball. Right, so first first in frame plus one plus the next. First in frame plus two, right? And we increment our counter first in frame by one because there's only one ball in a strike. So let's see if that works. Great, that test passes. Let's do a little bit of refactoring starting with our test. So call this roll strike. Uh, don't take that. Roll strike. We don't need that comment anymore. And if we go back to our code, this then becomes is is strike. Now, what else can we refactor? Got rid of the comments. That's good. Got a nice self-explanatory method. That's good. Let's get let's let's get rid of these and put them, replace them with something that we can easily understand. So let's call this one next two balls for strike. Let's call this one. Next ball for spare. Keep the originals. Don't replace that. Okay. And then, then this one is just next two balls in frame. Okay. Right, so do our tests run? Yes, they do run. Great. So, done our refactoring. Right, what's the next most interesting uh, test case? So, it's a perfect game, right? So, a perfect game is 12 strikes in a row. And the score for that is 300. Right, so we can roll that perfect game. We can go roll mini uh, 12 strikes, 12, 10 pins each. Assert score, g dot score, and the score is 300. Okay, so this should fail. Oops. Why does that fail? Hmm? Let's do it again. Uh, oops, that 
that's odd. It's out of bad. Ah. Ooh, we've made a mistake somewhere. Okay, great. 12, roll mini, 12. Okay, let's have a look. Hmm. I must have made a mistake. Let me have a look. Right. Okay, are we incrementing first in frame? Yep. Okay, oops. How are we doing for time here? Um, got time to fix that? Probably not. Okay, right. Sorry, we're going to have to leave that where it is because otherwise we aren't going to have time to go through the rest of it. Um, so I've made an off by one error in there somewhere. I just can't remember where it is. So we will just have to leave that for now and go back to there. So um, right, that is essentially the complete game. This is my bugger side, which I don't have time to fix. Right, if we'd followed our design, we would have had something much, much more complicated. But the truth is that you know, we didn't actually need all of that code, right? This is basically all the code you need in order to do this. Um, so that's an interesting finding from something like this, right? We came up with the design. We thought it was pretty sensible. We, you know, we went through it, but we found out actually that we didn't need a whole bunch of stuff. It's much, much simpler than we thought. Does this always happen? No doesn't always, but sometimes it does. And the important thing is that when it does, you should follow the tests, not the design, right? Um, if you did start to do TDD on this real design, what you'd find is that there's no behavior, right? So if you started on roll, right, you try to write a test and basically there's no behavior there, right? So there's no calculation, nothing happens. Go up to frame, same thing, no behavior, right? Get to game, right? And you'll find suddenly you've got behavior to start testing, right? That's, we just short, I just shortcutted that process by starting there and in the interest, again, and just in the interest of time. So what did we learn? We see our tests fail and then pass. This is again, super, super important. It's surprisingly easy to write a test that doesn't do anything. We know that the test is actually testing something. This is really, really important. We found a code smell and fixed it. We started with the simplest test and worked up and we got a working system. My off by one bug aside. So test code is actually as important, if not more important than production code, right? Because, and if the tests and the design diverge, we follow the tests. So there's a lot of objections that come up for test driven design. And I'll just quickly go through some of these. Um, often they come up as questions. Uh, so just rather than do that, we'll just quickly go through them. Test the code and writing more code slows you down. So you save time debugging, right? That's a one-off saving, right? But it's not actually the most important one, right? So if you didn't write tests, you'd probably be trying to step through the code, trying to find the bugs. Right? You spend as much time writing TDD tests as you do doing that. But the most important thing is that over the whole project lifetime, you go faster. Right. So if you write something, you debug it, you, it works, you go on. Right. The next person who comes in to change that has no guide. Right. They have to go through, they have to learn how it works, they have to debug it, they have to test it. Right. If you've written tests, the next person comes in runs the tests, they go green, they write their failing test, they write their code, make sure all the tests are green and then they're gone, right? Tests keep on giving and they give to everybody who works on the project, right? This is one of the key things that allows you to go faster and to deliver value over long periods of time. Refactoring is rework, 
you should write the code correctly the first time. This doesn't actually ever happen, right? In 20 years of being a software developer, that just, if it happens, it's luck. Um, you know, you just can't count on this. The more interesting answer is that iterative development is pretty much part of every single creative activity, musicians, artists, engineering, everything. Start with something, change it, change it, change it, change it until you get to the finished thing and then you're done. A single change can cause hundreds of tests to break. This is usually because you've got coupling in your application or your tests, right? This is a refactoring problem. Tests are not matter, not when they're written. People often like to write code first and then write the tests afterwards. This, again, this is the problem about not seeing your tests fail, right? So the problem with this is then, you know, they write the test, it doesn't test anything, it's useless. So, and so they're not, you know, tests at the end, people don't trust them. Also, it means that every line of production code is tested. If people write tests at the end, you'd be lucky to get 30 or 40% coverage. You know, if you're using TDD, you'll probably get 80 to 90% without even really trying. More objections. There's a lot of objections. What about legacy code? Do small refactorings. Um, so usually they are things like your IDE or LA to do safe refactorings, particularly with languages like Java, where the refactoring support is really good. You can refactor out the code uh, and write tests for that, right? Um, Databases and services. This is a, this is an interesting point, right? So generally, you you put an abstraction layer in, and then you mock them, right? So there's lots of good mock frameworks for Java. Um, Mockito is the one that we usually use. Right? These things are great for this, right? You don't you don't want to ever include external dependencies in your unit tests for, because they're slow, and because if they fail, then you have to spend time working out why they failed, and that's bad. TDD is too hard. This is a common objection. Practice, pair program with someone who knows how to do it and learn to use your IDE properly, right? You saw me using keyboard shortcuts there all the time. They're crucial in order to be able to do this kind of stuff effectively, right? You don't need to know a lot of them, but you know, five or six are the most important ones and, and, and they really improve your productivity. Are there circumstances where you shouldn't use it? Yes. GUI development, right? This thing needs to be a different shade of green. It needs to be two pixels to the right no point in writing that you just can't test that you shouldn't even try what you should test is all of the all of the behavior that sits underneath that right and that's easy that's definitely testable right but the actual visual bits no um and the other cases where you want to test things like well, you've got a container that is effectively acting as a test right so you want if the goal is make something run on aws then your best thing is actually just run it in aws right Trying to write a unit test for that is just rewriting AWS, which is silly. Right. But all the layers below these things should be TDD. Right. That's it. We are done and we have five minutes left for questions. Do we have any questions? Actually, I should unshare my screen. Hello. Are there any questions? Just feel free to unmute yourself and ask or type it out in the chat. Any questions? Uh, hi, Jake. So I have a question. Yeah. Sure. So I yeah, I just wanted to ask. Uh, so like uh, right now, uh, cause I'm like a front end dev at the moment. So like uh, there's a very new, like a lot of people are go are using like React testing library where they don't like focus on like the implementation details. They just focus more on like whether you when you click a certain button, whether certain like things render on the page or not, that type of thing. So it really doesn't rely a lot on implementation details, but more of like what the DOM renders. So I'm not sure if that's like linked to what you said earlier about like testing for like a pixel left or pixel to the right. Yeah. Like this type of test is really more linked to, you know, like talking about how the user will interact with your software. So in that type of like scenarios, would you recommend like we use like test-driven development? So this, the, the, you, you can use test-driven development for the behavior. Right, so GUIs where button clicks do things, then you have some behavior, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes this behavior is incredibly trivial, you know, click it, change the color, um, you know, it's marginal as to whether that's worth worth testing, right? But some, but any sort of more complex behavior in GUIs and particularly with things like React, they allow you to build quite complex behavior. Um, 
you should you should definitely test the behavior level of it. I mean, there's a bit of a judgment call as to where you draw the line between GUI and behavior. Um, but, you know, there is a line there and you can definitely um, you can definitely use TDD on the behavior part. I mean, I think there's well supported uh, unit test frameworks for React and most JavaScript con components. Okay, I see. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I just want to like add on to that question. So why do you not recommend that we do use the TDD paradigm on like GUI stuff? Is it because at the iteration time it takes for you to build up your test and all, it will be like probably a lot longer and... So it's very hard to actually make an assertion about GUI things, right? So like, mm -hmm. you know, you, you end up with these very, very complex things like, um, you know, you've got to write an application that takes the, renders the DOM and takes a screenshot and identifies the part that you're looking at and then makes a whole bunch of assertion, assertions about that. And that's extremely complex. I mean, these frameworks do exist, but they're very, like they're, they're difficult to set up. They're a lot of work and they don't really return the value that you want. I mean, the whole point of, the, of TDD is that, it, you know, it needs to be fast. You need to be able to work at the sort of speed that you saw me working, right? And if you're trying to do this with GUI components, you're probably not going to get to that speed and you're just going to find that you, it takes too much time and delivers too little value. This is why I keep, I, I say, keep it to the behavior levels of these things. All right. Okay. I think there's some questions for you in the chat. Cool. Uh, yeah. um, what code editor? It's uh, IntelliJ. Um, it looks different because it's in presentation mode, right? So it makes everything big and hides all the menus and stuff like that. Um, but it's basically just IntelliJ. Um, just wondering on the 20th frame, it's a strike. How do you calculate the points scored on the next frame? Uh, Yes, I can't remember is the answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I do also have a question. Sure. You. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, probably like a little bit, I run a little bit uh, to what Chris asked earlier. How do you usually like decide whether like you want to use like TDD approach versus like whether you will be going directly to I don't know, write up the code because at least, uh, I don't know, based on like my personal experience, I guess, uh, which probably like very limited compared to yours. Uh, I feel like sometimes there are many parts of like the program that, has, that is like quite difficult to test. So let's say like uh, what Chris mentioned earlier when dealing with like front end or perhaps like when working, I don't know, uh, I don't know, I find it quite difficult to test like something like concurrent programs and, uh, and then like something that is like quite low level sometimes it's just like so there are so many uncertainties over there and it's not like uh really easy to test i guess so uh how do you usually like work on, so, uh, on this? so the how, how to decide so so, so obviously the, the the common pattern you see is that things towards the boundary of your system right so your gui is one boundary right databases services file systems, they, they are other boundaries of your system, right? So things towards the boundary, generally you don't want to use TDD too much, right? Um, generally what you'll use is for GUIs, you won't test the GUI, you'll test the behavior behind the GUI just below that. For other ones, you'll, you'll test like say databases and services, you'll have a, a, um, a, a an abstraction layer somewhere and that you'll probably just use mocks for that abstraction layer, right? Generally, everything inside the system you can test. Um, sometimes you have systems that don't have a lot of behavior, right? So like CRUD applications where you're just basically taking something from a GUI and writing it into a database and and reading it out of the database and putting it in a GUI, right? So in, in those systems, what you'll find is that TDD is of limited use because really it's just about plumbing. Right, you're just piping data one way and piping data the other way. I mean, you can do. There's a few cases, but I mean, for, for those for those sort of CRUD systems, there are a few cases you can test, but it's not massively useful. But the truth is that most useful systems have have behavior, have logic, right? And the key thing is that when you're developing one of these systems using TDD, you start with the behavior and the logic, right? So you don't start with the endpoints. You start with the behavior in the middle, 
Right, so one thing I see a lot of uh, new developers doing is they start with all the endpoint stuff and then build in towards the middle. Right, but that doesn't that often doesn't end up working very well, and you end up with very code that's very hard to test. Right, so you start with the behavior. Right, so you need a system that is a calculator. Right, so you do the functions that actually do your calculations and you test those. Right, because those are things that work really well with TDD, and then you start building out from there. If, I don't know if that makes sense. Oh yeah, yeah, thank you. And for me, like, uh, have you ever feel like whether like TDD slows you down? I mean, because like you need to write a lot of test cases, and then like you don't spend like so much time thinking more on the like other design things. Right. Well, you generally do a bit of design up front, right? Um, you know, certainly for bigger systems, you'll have some idea of a design. Um, but I mean, the whole point is that TDD, if you're doing it well, it shouldn't take much of your time. Right? I mean, how much of my time that I spend writing tests and how much did I did spend writing code? I mean, you know, maybe 50-50, you know, uh, but it's pretty quick, right? I mean, it's very slow. If, 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 if you have trouble using the IDE, TDD becomes very slow. And, and one thing I've seen is that developers who aren't, um, developers aren't particularly conversant with using their IDEs find TDD frustrating because they have to, they start clicking around with their mouse and going through menus and, you know, it just takes, it, that, that really makes it very slow. Um, but generally, you know, certainly for when you've got interesting behavior, it doesn't, it doesn't really slow you down that much because what you've got to think is that the time you're spending writing those tests is time that you probably don't have to spend stepping through your code. Um, there's a question about prototyping. Um, yeah, so this is interesting. Um, if you've got a system where you've the behavior is significant, I would still use it. Um, if you've got a prototype that is, if you've got a lot of plumbing in the prototype, maybe not. Uh, but what you'll find often, though, is that prototypes end up being successful prototypes end up being pro production systems, All right? So the important parts of the system, the behavior parts of the system, the parts that actually do the stuff that your users care about, that provide the value that you need, those should probably have TDD regardless. And the idea is that it doesn't cost you that much to do them in those areas of the system. Okay. Uh I think we don't have time for any more questions because we need to bring the second talk. Uh, thank you, Jake, for uh, giving us a talk on TDD. I think all of us got to learn a lot more about testing in general. Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks, everyone. Um, good night. <laughs> hey, goodbye. <laughs>
Uh, just about a year and a half. So I joined, um, uh, I think May last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's been uh, great so far. It's, uh, it's a small company, but uh, it's, uh, it's a great working place. So I'm quite right. happy about it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, let me go. Uh, so Jake, a couple questions. You would you mind if people stop you while you're talking to ask questions? Oh, absolutely, I would. I would actually much prefer that if if uh, if the format allows. Uh, I was just kind of thinking and talking to colleagues here. Uh, it's kind of weird to present into nothing. Okay. So if people can actually come come back with questions and and you know uh, okay. ideas or things they don't understand or maybe I didn't explain well, that would be much much better. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, thanks for staying for the second talk and, and the people who have joined for the second talk specifically. So the second talk is titled Using Machine Learning for Creating Optimal Strategies for Imperfect in Information Games. In this case, it's poker uh, in the slide. Uh, and we have Dennis from Alpha Lab Capital speaking. Uh, Dennis is, is a senior quantitative researcher at Alpha Lab and He's been working at he has, he's had many years of experience working in the high frequency trading industry so as as i was asking him he has worked at places like jump trading and tower capital before so uh he'll be taking over the talk now but feel free to for, feel free to interrupt him and ask questions if you if you're shy to if you're shy to ask us uh if you're shy to ask verbally feel free to type it out in the chat okay yeah uh yeah dennis over to you uh, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, letting us uh, present and having us here uh, virtually. Um, hopefully someday uh, soon uh, in person. But uh, um, I guess uh, yeah, happy happy to be here, guys. And uh, um, I'm going to be talking today um, about um, some kind of you know basic and some advanced machine learning concepts um, for uh, I guess generally games um more so the imperfect information games and uh how to kind of figure out strategies and how to code that and some tooling for that as well and we're going to be using mostly um python here to um to kind of uh, uh get get some solutions i guess um uh, as uh yeah i guess uh, i was presented already so there's not much to say about myself but i'll you know talk about a little bit about the company and uh we are, I think, uh, 11 or 12 now. Uh, this is a photo from a year ago when uh, we were allowed to meet. And uh, um, uh, I guess, uh, you know, it's kind of growing. We're hiring quite aggressively. So uh, if people are curious about the company, um, do go to the website, um, send us questions, these uh, emails, uh, or, or just reach to me directly. Uh, and uh, we'll be happy to talk to you. So, um, and, uh, you know, about the Alpha Lab, it's, uh, Pretty much a um, HFT shop at the moment. Uh, it's kind of, a, I guess, similar to um, other high frequency trading places, uh, with the difference that it's much smaller, which a kind of allows us for a much faster kind of cycle of development and going for uh, much more frontier markets. And uh, at the same time, you kind of get a lot more uh, different type of exposures you have in a traditional uh, sort of trading trading place. So. Um, you kind of get to work with uh, senior people and uh, with uh, with market directly as well. So uh, I guess um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the structure of this. Uh, and uh, quite quite honestly, it's um, it's a very complex topic, and um, it, it it's at least you know worth a whole course at a university. And I'm just going to be um, kind of slightly touching some 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 sides of it and trying to introduce people to um, concepts. But um, the, the other thing as well, which is quite important, we um, uh, just just for uh, NUS hackers, we, uh, we're organizing a small uh, poker bot competition, um, which is uh, for one week from, from, from today uh, until Friday next week. Uh, the deadline is 9 a.m. So you can submit your solutions uh, to that. And uh, we, we offer a prize. Uh, I think we offer some Amazon vouchers. Um, so it's, uh, it's actually a cash prize. And uh, I think there's some other prizes, t-shirts or company company stuff. But uh, yeah, obviously um, very much uh, welcome for uh, any, any, guy, any solutions you have guys. And uh, they'll, be, they'll be great. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the, the specifics of that at the end of the talk. Um, 
Uh, but um, yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of the idea. And um, I guess I'll start with some basic kind of game theory uh, concepts um, like Nash Equilibrium or sort of regret minimization, which is uh, kind of a classic um, algorithm for figuring out um, or, or kind of approximating Nash Equilibriums in uh, some of these games. And then um, we'll kind of try to grow complexity from there. Uh, first, um, moving into, you know, sort of the world of sequential games, uh, which poker is part of, and then going more into, uh, I guess, different types of poker. Um, we, we're going to kind of talk about three, three types here. Uh, first being the uh, Kun poker, and it's probably the simplest poker you can ever come up with. There's only three uh, cards in the deck, uh, the two players, and uh, there's only one uh, kind of round of action. Um, and then the, the next version is uh, Leduc Poker, uh, which uh, I'm going to give an example of how to solve using um, a, uh, a rel card uh, library. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about a little bit about um, uh, No Limit Hold'em, uh, which is quite, quite complex, I guess. Uh, and that's what the uh, competition is going to be about um, and the, the submissions are going to be aimed at. Uh, so uh, yeah, let's let's get started. Uh, so there's quite a big universe of uh, Pokebot competitions, and uh, it's uh, probably quite uh, booming. Maybe since uh, five, ten years ago, there's uh, quite a I guess a, a progress um, every couple of years uh, made in the field. And the most recent one being a Facebook paper released, I think, two years ago about uh, Pluribus, which is the first. Um, uh, no limit hold'em poker in multiplayer, which outperformed um, quite a few pros. They had, a, I think, an experiment with 10,000 hands, and uh, it was quite statistically significant. Uh, and then there's probably quite a few papers before uh, coming in that frequency solving, you know, slightly less complex versions of poker uh, or slightly different um, uh, com kind of uh, permutations of poker as well. Uh, so. Um, why, why poker and why, why computational poker? I think for me personally, it's um, quite uh, an interesting field and I, I do enjoy the game. Uh, don't get to play much in Singapore, but um, uh, I, I was quite a uh, poker player uh, back, in, uh, back in London, I guess, not, not, not so much here. But um, now, uh, maybe from like two, three years ago, I kind of started looking at it from the computationalist perspective. And it kind of gives a kind of a nice overlap of uh, things like game theory or decision making, um, statistics and machine learning and um, different sort of simulation environments. And I think, you know, for people who are kind of interested in that, uh, I think that's a great area to um, explore. It's not very well developed. Um, so I don't know if uh, in the, the, the audience is familiar with uh, sort of the DQN style um, deep mind papers, which I guess started coming out from 2016, and uh, the the uh, progressively introduced new uh, methods for solving different types of games, and obviously the uh, AlphaGo being a great example of that in 2017. Um, and then uh, the poker hasn't been so much solved, I guess. Uh, I think the multiplayer no limit is not solved yet. It's the the algos are finally performing better than human only since a year or two ago. So I think it's a kind of an area which is uh, developing, and the the game is actually quite complex uh, from from the point of view of uh, asymmetry of information. It's much harder to model the game states and actually learn from it rather than from chess or go, which are much more um, in, in terms of the uh, state complexity. Sort of the uh, go is much more complex uh, than poker, but there's no asymmetry of information. You know what your opponent is doing. Um, you know the board, and uh, you, there's no hidden state. Uh, while in poker, uh, you don't know the opponent's cards, and you don't know what they're basing their decisions off. So it's much harder to uh, learn from this kind of environments. And um, I guess, yeah, the, the two kind of main packages which are most interesting for poker in Python world are um, the Pi, uh, let me minimize this, the Pi Poker Engine and the RL card. Uh, and the RL card is being a package from the uh, NM University uh, of Texas. Uh, it just came out, I think, a few months ago. It's 
actually quite interesting. They're basically trying to replicate the um, AI gym uh, from uh, OpenAI to uh, allow for a variety of environments uh, to, um, uh, to simulate poker and learn from it in kind of a rail style. And then the Pi, Pi Poker Engine is something which existed for a while. And I think that's uh, uh, kind of a, you know, it's maybe a bit old school. It's not, there's not much functionality there, but you can simulate the game. You can uh, introduce strategies and kind of play, play, against, uh, play against each other. Uh, and that's what we're going to use for, um, for the submission um, uh, for the competition, which I'm going to talk a bit more about uh, at the end. So um, I guess this is a kind of a um, approach to, to poker. And since poker has, um, uh, I think I deleted the slide about, oh yeah, it's here. Uh, the, uh, the state complexity is uh, around uh, uh, 10 in the power of 75 uh, game states, uh, which is very hard to compute. So you have to come up with a lot of um, sort of state uh, space reduction techniques or, or trying to approximate them or combine or cluster them. And that's what the, this paper sort of deal with. Uh, you have to, uh, the action space is quite large. It's actually infinite because it's uh, no limit means that you can race to any continuous number, uh, any rational number, uh, which makes it quite harder compared to uh, other sort of uh, pot limit types, variations of poker. Um, and uh, I guess there's sort of uh, two main uh, techniques here uh, in the literature which try to solve it. Um, one is being the uh, counterfactual um, uh, regret minimization um, and uh, that kind of goes into the deep learning world and uh, approximating these functions there and the other one being uh, the uh, kind of self-play um, type approach uh, as well. So there's a little bit of difference, but uh, you know, in terms of the actual under the hood kind of uh, attack, they kind of start converging. And then uh, you can kind of play around with the uh, feature engineering. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, uh, which might be helpful for the uh, submission uh, to the competition if you decide to participate. And uh, obviously, yeah, a lot of this paper is to kind of innovate with um, quite a bit of uh, optimizations uh, in uh, dealing with this kind of large, large state uh, spaces. Um, so I guess with, um, with poker uh, and any game, uh, there's this concept of sort of uh, Nash equilibrium, and uh, I'm guessing most of the people are going to be familiar with that. Um, um, hi, Dennis. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I think there's a question in the chat, uh, which by Jet, which is. Let me try to find it. Uh, let me open it. Okay. Uh, Hanabi, I actually don't know much about the game. Um, I kind of saw the semantics of it uh, and, and think it's, uh, there is, as far as I understand, it's a cooperative game, right? And you try to build the most beautiful fireworks, right? Uh, it's, it's kind of a multiplayer game where you have a common objective and you're trying to complete that. So I'm not sure if you actually don't know the cards of other people. Um, but if that's the case, it becomes um, also, um, uh, I guess, a symmetric information game or hidden information game. Um, the difference, again, it's kind of a cooperative game, so it's a, a very different field. Uh, like a lot of this sort of theoretical concepts deal well with um, zero-sum games and competitive games because uh, they give kind of a nice symmetrical properties and uh, Nash equilibrium type type things. So uh, to me, Hanabi is more of a, uh, like a solving problem, right? Because uh, there's not really, you don't play against someone, you kind of have a common strategy and you're figuring out. So it's more like an optimization with uncertainty rather than, um, I guess, a um, uh, sort of, uh, game playing playing versus an opponent and trying to guess their strategy and um, trying to maximize your own profit by minimizing their profit. So um, I think that's kind of a, I mean, as far as I understand how that be, I don't actually, I've never played it, but I've seen, seen the, uh, the, the uh, kind of trailer for it, I guess. Um, so um, going back to kind of Nash, it's, you know, kind of on a, on a high level, it's uh, basically a set of strategies uh, which you know, one per player, 
uh, which uh, are very stable in the sense that anyone who would deviate from, from Nash equilibrium would be uh, worse off by, um, by doing that rather than staying in, in the Nash equilibrium. Um, and the deviation is kind of considered at a one step level. So every time uh, you know, somebody kind of walks away from that, they're worse off, but not at the same time. And that's kind of uh, considered stable. Most of this uh, Nash equilibrium type strategies are gonna be mixed strategies where you sort of assign probabilities to actions you do. And that's how uh, most of poker is played. Uh, there's a lot of concepts of mixing um, and kind of uh, trying to uh, mask your ranges and uh, um, confuse the opponent with that. So uh, there's a lot more, generally a lot more mixed strategies than pure strategies uh, with kind of, you know, 100% probability kind of greedy action type thing. And, uh, you know, there's a whole question in poker world around using Nash equilibrium or playing, um, or playing exploitative game where you can kind of uh, tailor your style against, uh, against an opponent by gathering some statistics uh, and trying to um, uh, kind of uh, figure out their style and exploit that. And here's an example where if you play versus someone who plays badly in, in poker, normally they're called fish, um, you might actually be better off by playing a not a Nash equilibrium strategy, but more kind of a exploitative strategy. But obviously you're gonna be losing to the um, uh, kind of game theory optimal strategy. Uh, as well, so but you kind of may have to make these choices live when you when you play the thing. So um, we we'll kind of try to um, the, kind of the next twenty minutes, I'm going to try to talk about different games before we get back to uh, like no limit because no limit again, uh, it's a very very complex game and uh, hasn't been solved yet uh, properly for uh, like a multiplayer version of it uh, and uh, I think it's much easier to explain some of this um, sort of machine learning theoretical things um, on much simpler games. And uh, we can start with uh, the most simple game uh, one can think about is rock, paper, scissors. And um, this is sort of uh, normally how uh, a game will be represented uh, in a uh, payout or payoff kind of reward matrix. Um, and the first number is the payout for the first player, the second number for the second player. And obviously you choose your actions, uh, rock, paper, scissors. And, Everybody knows how it works, uh, and there's a draw with zero zero payout, and if you know somebody chooses paper, uh, the first player, which is a column, uh, gains the rock, they win, and the other player loses. Um, so that's a kind of a very simple, um, very simple, I guess, game. And I'm going to first demonstrate how to try to get um, an optimal strategy for that uh, using. Um, uh, using uh, a computer or, or kind of a simple Python without anything, any libraries at all. Uh, and I guess, you know, uh, you know, I would love to ask the audience what's, what would be the strategy, the Nash equilibrium strategy here, but uh, it's obviously a mixed strategy, just playing, um, playing a random, uh, well, equally random action out of three actions with uh, one third probability assigned to it. And any of that strategy would be uh, not a Nash equilibrium strategy. Uh, people, would be worse off by playing any other strategy because it would be uh, it could be exploited, um, and the concept of um, kind of regret minimization is uh, you kind of would be playing the game in iterations and then you're looking at the end of the uh, of the of the round and you're comparing your actual result versus any other possible result you have, um, which is uh, very simple here because there's only. Uh, three actions you could have taken. So you compare versus two other actions and you assign uh, regrets uh, to these actions. Um, obviously you wanna play something which will defeat your opponent so that action becomes more likely uh, or higher in regrets. And you keep accumulating these regrets uh, pretty much kind of in that average kind of level. Um, and you know, to, to get the optimal strategy for, for this type of uh, thing, you just basically normalize it by a number of uh, rounds you accumulated this information for. Um, which is quite simple and this is what this code is doing. Um, so this, for example, if you take a um, strategy of someone, let's say playing uh, the first number here, I think is uh, rock, um, playing let's say 90% time rock, 10% time paper and never playing scissors um, and just doing all the strategy all the time, obviously the best strategy to play against that person is gonna be to play paper, um, uh, uh, to play paper all the time because uh, it maximizes your, um, your, your winning. Um, so basically that's what it kind of learns and you can see that um, kind of 
gets that uh, optimal strategy pretty quickly uh, on, uh, uh, on on this uh, it's 10,000 uh, iterations epoch. So, uh, and you know, if you kind of play against uh, the same strategy, uh, it ends up converging to Nash, which is just uh, playing all um, three actions with equal probability of just one third. Um, and uh, it kind of becomes an optimal strategy. So this is a very simple game. There's no, um, um, well, there is a hidden information. You don't know what your player is going to play in simultaneous action. And uh, people normally model as a uh, hidden information game. But uh, at the same time, uh, there's no uh, sequential. So it's a very single round game. So it's very simple. Uh, you don't have to think uh, like too, too much about it. It's a kind of, kind of, uh, uh, pretty pretty straightforward. And then uh, if if we take the most simple version of poker, kind of deviating from uh, the um, rock paper scissors game, uh, it's going to be a kun kun poker or kun poker, and that's a, a heads up version with only three cards in the deck, which is a jack, queen, a king. And uh, at the end of the game, uh, if it gets to a showdown where yeah, both players are going to show their hands, the highest cards will win. So uh, you just you only dealt one card, and um, there's only three cards in the deck, so there cannot be two kings. There's not going to be two queens, and uh, um, uh, and uh, there's only single round of betting. So there's only uh, two actions you can do. Uh, it's either bet or check or call, um, or to check rather. Uh, and then um, you can, if you're a first player, you decide whether you bet or you just check, which you yield your um, action or you turn to the next player, and the next player can. I either call you bat, uh, which is going to be represented by bat here as well, uh, or just to call and it will just uh, go to showdown. If you bat before and the second player doesn't want to call that, they can they can uh, normally represent it as fault, and here it's represented as just a call because it's kind of the same action. It's just not adding more money to the pot essentially. And you start a game with uh, contributing one, let's say, dollar uh, to the pot uh, to the common um, pile of money, and then the one who wins it. At the end, will win, uh, will win the uh, how much, how, whatever is uh, in in the pot, and it can be either two or it can be uh, can be uh, can be four, um, depending on whether the uh, betting round uh, was uh, successful or not, uh, meaning that both people actually contributed more money there. And um, the way to think about it is normally, um, and you know, we're going to talk about the. Uh, counterfactual regret minimization, uh, which is very similar to the previous concept. You still keep accumulating this uh, sort of deviations from the optimal strategy. But in this case, you actually have uh, a few steps. Uh, it's, it's kind of sequential, right? It's not so simple because uh, uh, there's uh, quite uh, quite a few states you actually have to assign it to as well. And uh, normally, you kind of represent a history with um, both the uh, card you've been dealt with and the kind of history of actions which have been taken before, uh, which is the common information set. Uh, and uh, that actually has a, a theoretical Nash equilibrium, which is um, pretty, um, it's actually infinite number of equilibriums. And uh, uh, you can sort of describe it uh, with some formulas. Uh, and you can find it on Wikipedia. And there's a paper about it as well, which is pretty cool. But um, with, um, with kind of Python uh, way kind of uh, Again, it's a very, very similar uh, way of doing things here. And um, I guess the way to think about it uh, is applying the same concept of regret matching, which we did before with rock, paper, scissors, but assigning probabilities of reaching that very state you're in, uh, because every state has a certain probability of uh, being, being reached based on the strategy which was played by you know, both players. Uh, so you kind of uh, call this recursively, as you can, you can see here, uh, and then you end up accumulating regrets, uh, which are discounted the probabilities. And then you kind of do the same thing as before, you just accumulate, uh, kind of normalize these regrets, and it gives you, a, gives you an optimal strategy. Um, so this is something which has been run for, I don't remember, I think 100,000 uh, iterations or something, and uh, it kind of converges to one of the... Um, um, potential equilibriums. Uh, one thing to note is the, the first player is actually um, in, in a Nash equilibrium. Uh, it's going to be a losing player. It's better to play uh, the second player in this game. Uh, so there's a, I guess, first player disadvantage. Um, and uh, the, uh, you know, it's kind of 
took some Wikipedia thing uh, at the end and it basically says that the probability of uh, betting with a jack, which is the weakest card for the first player, is a, should be from zero to a third, and then the rest of it can be derived based on uh, uh, based on formulas and basically it yields you an infinite number of uh, equilibrium uh, equilibria, uh, which are all mixed mixed strategy equilibria. And again, there's no pure strategy equilibrium here. Um, are there any questions here at, at this point? Uh, should you want to kind of describe the uh, the history or what, what's actually going here, or we can move on here? I uh, don't know how to check that, but I guess I'll just look at the chat and uh, yeah, there's no questions. We can assume that it's all good to go. Um, so um, the next version uh, is something to um, look with uh, the our RL card library and it offers a quite a nice um, environment uh, to, uh, I guess, try to model and train different types of uh, agents for different types of games, different types of card games. They have blackjack, they have, uh, I think, three, four versions of poker, um, they have, um, I forgot, uh, Uno as well, I think, which is quite a popular card game. Uh, I don't think I played it, but uh, um, they have quite a few games, uh, but they're all card card based games and they offer a few um, uh, I guess ways of doing it. And I guess the main two again is the uh, sort of the uh, uh, NFSP, which is the uh, uh, self play type uh, algorithm. And then there's a uh, uh, sort of the CFR, which is a counter uh, factual graph minimization. Uh, and then there's different variations in them as well. Um, and you can kind of, um, Go to the library, open Python, and uh, they have quite a few examples. And this is uh, one of the examples that do just this is what it takes to set up a um, an agent uh, for uh, a Leduc poker. And Leduc poker is something which is slightly more complex than uh, uh, Kunz poker. It still only has three cards, but there are, uh, there's one community card, which means that a card uh, which is uh, a, a public information and it will be shared between the two players. And now you have combinations of cards as well, where you sort of um, sort of uh, uh, play uh, play versus, I guess, uh, not a single card, but uh, like it's always better to have a pair. Um, and if you don't have a pair, um, then the highest card will win. And if you have a pair, the highest pair will win. So it's a pretty uh, simple game still, uh, but quite quite a bit more complex than uh, Coins Poker. And uh, this is the um, the self play. Uh, Sort of, um, uh, it's a neural uh, factitious self-play algorithm, and uh, it learns pretty quickly what, what to do here, and it gets pretty stable. And again, this is a reasonably simple game. Uh, and you can model that and play play against uh, against the um, the trained agent and uh, get them to play against each other as well and measure their uh, success rate. I guess um, the uh, I think there is a question in the chat. Um, what do you do? Uh, sorry, can I check what does the numerical value of your work here represent? Uh, that's a good question, actually. Um, I think it's some kind of normalized, uh, um, I guess, uh, let me think about it. I think it would be something like a normalized uh, reward. Uh, and uh, there's actually no, um, the way you set it up here, there's no uh, setting uh, for the structure of the game, which normally have, you know, large and small blinds and you have some kind of a stack and you kind of uh, uh, tend, to, tend to measure the winnings in, in, in monetary terms, but I guess they set up some kind of a normalized environment and um, one seems to be kind of an optimal number. So uh, I haven't looked too deep into it, but uh, I think it's just sort of a normalized abstracted number. Right? Um, and obviously when, when they train the, uh, the underlying neural nets, they use the, uh, the, the usual kind of loss type functions. So, um, and you can you can specify the different penalties here as well. Um, so this is uh, kind of the case of Leduc poker, which is uh, um, kind of well solved and presented by uh, this library. And I think this library is quite nice, and you can play. And it also has a no limit uh, hold'em as well, which is quite more complex. And I'll just talk a little bit about that, uh, uh, just kind of to explain the uh, competition. Uh, submission guidelines and uh, things around there. Um, generally, you have 
you know, five community cards and two private cards, uh, which is quite more complex than uh, Coins Poker or the Duke Poker. And then there's uh, the winning hands would normally be participating in this kind of uh, combination matrix where um, uh, you're trying to get the, um, the I guess, the lowest row here, which is the strongest one and the least likely, in the, the sorted in the uh, uh, likelihood of occurrence. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, but uh, um, I guess you, you're combining your cards with the community cards and then you're, um, you're playing the best combination out of five cards you can combine. There are also four betting rounds, which is quite, quite a lot, and they, all of them can go in uh, infinite number of iterations. Uh, because you can actually, uh, you're allowed to re-raise the person who uh, increased the stake compared to the two versions reviewed before where if somebody raises you either call or fold, uh, you either discontinue playing or you uh, participate and contribute more money, but you cannot uh, force the other player to contribute more money, the betting always stops. So it kind of gives a very, very complex trees. And if you, uh, if you uh, ever kind of looked at a particular hand and kind of uh, building this tree, uh, it actually takes uh, probably hundreds of gigabytes just to uh, build a sort of a single post-flop um, hand where there are three community cards exposed uh, and you kind of simulating versus uh, one opponent. Um, so it's a lot, it's a very, very large state and it's kind of hard to model this tree and that's where like a lot of optimizations and um, kind of techniques are being um, kind of advanced in, in this more recent papers. Um, so I think I guess I'll just go through like very quickly some more kind of feature engineering type things where if you were to write one for no limit, um, you can kind of take a more feature engineering type approach where you can uh, try to encode some things which make sense uh, from observing what optimal play should look like. And this is kind of a hand range with a starting hand, you have two hands and obviously some are better than the others and it kind of shows you the uh, top 7% of hands I guess here. And, um, uh, you know, you can kind of introduce different type of feature engineering. You can kind of look at this and Google it later. I don't think it's worth going too much into it, but uh, there's a few numbers which you can use to describe a strategy in the game of your opponent. You can keep track of them. And if you see that, let's say somebody is uh, playing very, very far from Nash Equilibrium, you can try to figure out whether you want to switch your strategy from Nash Equilibrium to a more exploitative strategy against what they're actually doing. Uh, if you were to do that, like uh, when, when people study this kind of things, they actually don't look at this uh, aspect. But uh, obviously, if you were to play or you were to uh, build a poker board to play with real people to play against others, you kind of want to do that as well to keep track of some some slippage they have in, in, uh, in their strategy. Um, so uh, kind of going to review a little bit uh, the um, practical part of the um, uh, of the submission aspect uh for um participating in the competition so we're going to use the pi poker engine and uh, you can install it pretty simply let's just agree that we've used python 3.7 what we use here and um the latest version of pi poker engine um and the setup is pretty simple you kind of explain uh, the uh, setting of the game and number of players and uh, who is playing and basically the interface here you just specify the algorithm you you're giving in the fish play is something you're going to write. Uh, so I think there's an example of this here, which is basically uh, you have to implement a few methods here to keep track of them. And if you want to go into the world of sort of neural networks, you kind of have to map that into the action spaces and the information uh, as it arrives. Um, you can use the uh, Arial card library to interact with this as well and uh, um, kind of trying to train it. Um, but obviously you can train it just outside in, in a Arial card. And then if you have some, some solution, um, you can try to integrate the solution into the, uh, the engine here. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Basically, this one is just always going to be uh, calling or checking no matter what, what, the, uh, what, what the action was before. So it, does, it completely ignores the cards and it just plays um, call all the time, which is pretty bad strategy. That's why it's called a fish player. Um, you can go somewhere, somewhere more complex with this uh, library as well. So, uh, this is an example of um, basically a very straightforward uh, Monte Carlo. I wouldn't even say game tree simulation. It's uh, just a uh, Monte Carlo simulation of chances of winning, given what you see on the board, um, uh, without accounting for other player strategy. 
and uh, if the wind count uh, is uh, high enough, um, then uh, you would uh, just call or raise. Uh, that's a very simple strategy, right? Uh, obviously, it doesn't account for the actions of other player and their range and their, 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 the full information sets. It's not a very, very far from a strategy, but that's kind of a starting block you can use uh, if you were to explore um, this type of strategies. Um, so a bit more about the competition, and that's uh, kind of, I guess, uh, coming to the end of uh, the talk. Um, so uh, submissions that would be done in teams of two to three people, um, let's agree that we're going to limit the uh, single decision time uh, for uh, a single sort of uh, round to 200 uh, milliseconds, because otherwise uh, it's going to take uh, too much time to uh, simulate all the uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of hands we're going to play uh, in simulation. Uh, the model size, let's try to limit it to 100 megabytes. And this kind of going back to this uh, game tree complexity, uh, just kind of a single um, hand with already dealt uh, three community cards can reach 100 gigabytes uh, for for some ways of simulating it. So um, the actually the whole model, you, if you train, if you decide to participate, uh, let's kind of agree that it's, it has to be under Hundred megabytes. Uh, the prices for the best team is uh, we we can give away um, hundred fifty dollars in Amazon vouchers, and uh, for anyone who submits a working solution, uh, we're gonna uh, give a T-shirt and some company um, some company stuff, I guess. Uh, and then uh, yeah, the basically the deadline is uh, Friday uh, next uh, week, uh, nine a.m. Uh, Singapore time. Uh, so you can send your code and uh, train models to uh, careers at alphalab.capital. Um, we'll share this uh, slide deck with um, with uh, with uh, any US hackers, and they, you know you can get from them somehow. And then uh, yeah, it would be great to see uh, a plethora of uh, great poker bots. So uh, hopefully uh, they they'll play great and they. Uh, uh, somebody wins the best the best will win uh, so uh, yeah I guess this is a good time for for questions uh, if there are any questions yeah thank you Dennis for bringing the talk about like the yeah the poker the machine learning and yeah so now we have come to the QA session so perhaps like for anyone want to ask questions you can just like unmute yourself and or type in in the chat box Yeah, perhaps like if uh, probably like some of them are still like quite shy or like still thinking about their question. Probably I want to ask like one question to you, Dennis. Like yeah. you, you talk a lot about like the uh, how we play. We are making decision where when playing like the poker game, and yeah, does it actually like have any relation with your work? I mean, at Alpha Lab when you are let's say making decision. And... Absolutely. Um, yeah, actually, that's great. The great question. Uh... I think I was meant to talk about it, but I forgot. And um, the uh, relevance is that, uh, you know, we, we kind of here deal with, uh, with markets. And uh, um, I mean, for actually, I, I did write like a poker board, I think 12 years ago. Uh, it actually worked pretty, pretty reasonably well. But uh, the, um, the relevance is that uh, when you deal with markets, they're very similar to um, uh, poker in the sense that uh, there's uh, a lot of Hidden states, right? You, if you look at the market, uh, you know it's uh, sort of trending up or trending down. It's sort of mean reversion or uh, what, what to do, kind of how to predict the next second or the next minute uh, or the next day of price. Uh, is a lot of hidden states, and people model it with different techniques. I think the way to think about it is kind of similar because um, um, you only can learn so much from a very, very noisy, uncertain environment. Uh, and in certain environment being, you know, cards on uh, shared cards or cards you have or uh, things you see from the opponent because uh, all of the strategies are mixed strategies. So it's a very, very uncertain environment, which is kind of hard to learn from. And I think the way you think about the problem and the way you try to learn from it is actually quite similar because um, at the end of the day, you're trying to achieve some statistical significance um, to your, your strategy or your, your algorithm to play poker. 
um, uh, by by do, you know looking at very very noisy data. Um, and I think that's uh, that's why it's very similar. And then you know obviously when you're uh, when you're in the market, you kind of um, trading against uh, other uh, participants and uh, often against other um, trading companies. And uh, I think it's a good way to think about it as a uh, kind of a, especially against the other trading companies, it's kind of a close to zero sum game. And you try to understand why, why they're doing certain actions and why they're uh, trading against you, if, they, if they're trading against you and uh, what's their edge and what's their strategy. And uh, if you can kind of model that, I think that gives you a pretty, pretty good starting point for kind of building a successful trading strategy. So I think it's a, uh, Kind of the 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 the, the feeling of it, the and, and the environment and the way of learning is kind of similar as uh, trading in, in real markets actually. Yeah, thanks a lot for answering my question. I think like there's a new question in the chat box. Right. Uh, okay. So there's a question about uh, the counterfactual regret uh, minimization compared to. Uh, let me try to go back here. Uh, compared to the. Um, the regret matching. Uh, so this was regret matching, and the sequential game has a, a kind of a CFR C CFR type um, algorithm. So here, um, first, uh, you're um, kind of uh, looking into multi-stage thing, and in the code, it's represented by calling a recursion, right? So if you first call this um, kind of CFR method. You'll, uh, you'll get the history and the history sort of uh, represents a string, uh, which if you can see, uh, I think this is gonna be a history. This is kind of a history representation, right? It uh, first starts just with the card you have and then uh, with your action um, and then the action of the uh, other player. Um, so you kind of uh, start doing this history and every time you're gonna call this recursion here, the history is gonna be updated with whatever happened. Uh, what's the other player done, what you've done, and um, it will be updated with the probability as well. So compared to like a single stage game where you pretty much know the outcome here and uh, uh, you kind of get your payoff right away based on what you've done because you kind of, the payoff matrix is uh, pretty straightforward for um, our action versus the opponent action. Uh, while here, let's say when you do the first action, the payout is still un un uh, unknown. So you have to keep calling this method. Um, you basically do like a, a game tree here uh, and then you update it and then uh, you kind of get a, a counterfactual values for um, for every history iteration in, in which case it's uh, pretty it's pretty easy here uh, the history like the history space is quite small and obviously if you get to other versions of poker the history space gets a lot more complex so I yeah, hope that helps. Are there any other questions from anyone? I think if there's no more question, then I guess, yeah, we will uh, just close off the session since I think we're we are also already like uh, run out of time. Yeah, and yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Dennis, yeah, for uh, giving the talk today. And yeah, for everyone, uh, for those of you who, want, uh, who are asking for the slides, I think, Chelsea already mentioned in the chat, you can email to them and we will also publish uh, the recording for this uh, for this Friday hacks into our YouTube channel as usual. Yeah, and perhaps we, uh, we can also uh, put like the links or uh, any relevant links in the description of uh, our posting later or in our website. So yeah, do look out for us. And yeah, probably one last thing I'm gonna share is Yep, yeah, and yeah, so uh, thank you very much for all of the spe uh, speakers. I think Jack, uh, Jake not here anymore. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you so much, Dennis, for being in the talk. And for everyone, yeah, we will really appreciate it if you can, yeah, give us, uh, give us some feedback. Uh, and just like share, uh, scan this QR code or 
go to the link. Yeah, I say this is this semester is quite challenging for us because usually we organize for the hacks in person. But yeah, this semester it's all everything is online via Zoom. So yeah, probably there's less interaction for me. We cannot really like meet and talk with it, each other. Yeah, so we will really appreciate it if you can give us feedback on how we can improve, uh, give feedback about the speakers as well. And if you have any interesting topics that you want us to bring in the Friday Hacks, yeah, do let us know. And yeah, so thanks everyone for coming and yeah, see you all in the next Friday Hacks two weeks from now. Thank you for having us. It was a great. Thanks, Steven. Yeah.